everybody, welcome back and welcome here from, for everybody from the other session. We start with this panel from the technology oriented sessions. Um, just because it was too much if we had all speakers on one panel, then there's no discussion possible. So that, that's the reason why we split it up again like we did it with the sessions. Um, once again, a few words about me, because half of you don't know me until now. I'm Eva, <laughs> I'm a science journalist, and I'm writing since many years about new technologies and how they are going to change our lives. And I am convinced that blockchain technology will change our lives somehow, but how uh, is more or less an open question. Um, we are in the very early stage of blockchain technology right now. Is it? Oh, yeah. um, so the big question is, what is it? How will this technology develop? Um, how are we going to do? What what are we going to do with it in the future? We see a big hype at the moment, and of course, um, the question is, will the reality live up the hype? And that is the thing we are going to discuss today. So I would love to start, no, I would love to say who we are, who, we, who, we, who you see in front of you, because again, only half of you know the people. Um, to my left, we have C. Mohan. He is an um, IBM fellow and former IBM India chief scientist. And he talked about the landscape of practical blockchain systems. The next is Donald Cosman. He is head of Microsoft Research and is, has talked about integrating blockchains into applications. The third is Silvio Micali, the only one everybody knows, I think, at least if you have been here in the morning. <laughs> and um, this two men on, on the total right side from your point of view are Roman Matsut and Martin Hense. They more or less count as one because they talk about the same topic. <laughs> um, they are from Aachen University and they do research around weaknesses of blockchain technology, especially when it comes to immutability. So I would love to start with a question, the same question for everybody and ask you to give the answer just one after another. Um, and the question is, which applications do you find most exciting? Well, as I just finished uh, saying in the other session, I'm more into private blockchains rather than public blockchains and cryptocurrencies and all that. So in that sense, uh, there are any number of uh, applications which are already in production usage things like uh, managing diamonds um, supply chain, which is Everledger. There's also um, IBM's work with uh, Walmart on food safety. That's already in production. And then with Maersk on international logistics, basically it's called global trade digitization, Maersk being the world's largest shipping company. So there are many non financial industry applications that are well on their way to becoming, you know, very commonly used production deployments of blockchain technology. Okay, my, my favorite application is called Distributed IDs. Um, there's this famous New Yorker cartoon in the 90s where, it's, where you have a dog and a cat in front of a, a, a computer and they say, on the internet nobody knows that you're a dog. <laughs> um, but sometimes you actually need to know that you're a dog. If you want to buy a can of beer on Amazon, um, you want to know that somebody is um, uh, older than 21 years old. So I like this problem. It's, it's actually a, um, uh, an emerging standard of the W3C. I like the problem because it, is, it has impact. It's kind of, we can relate to it. But it's also, it kind of has been informing me a lot on what is necessary, what are the concepts that are necessary, and what are the concepts that are overkill. Because if you have an application that's very concrete and has very easy use cases, you can kind of develop your, you can define the scientific or technical problem around it. Well, you know, I think of the best applications 
<laughs> we already know. <laughs> it's the, it's the one we don't quite have yet, because I feel, believe that we should be a bit of projecting out. And in my opinion, is uh, the ability of, uh, or at least the potential for humanity of having uh, self-governance, I think to me is uh, what uh, attracts me the most. Um, because uh, somehow governance is all about technology, right? So even uh, when in the good old times where we had no rules whatsoever, a dictatorship was the only possible type of human uh, governance. And it worked you know, quite well. And then only, you know, representative democracies are things about uh, which are linked uh, really to the um, uh, newspapers and means of communication uh, and so on and so forth. And so right now, however, we have uh, the ability, perhaps uh, for the first time, to start actually self-organizing ourselves. And that is really not representative, but totally decentralized. And uh, that's a big experiment. It may, uh, we may win, we may fail, but it's uh, definitely a big experiment. And uh, at least in my lifetime, which dates me quite a bit, I saw <laughs> at least uh, two revolutions and a potential one. Uh, the first one is really the advent of a personal computer. Right? I mean, I really have uh, this uh, technical instrument calculator. Then we have uh, really the internet and communication. Okay, we can send messages to each other quite well. But the other one, really, to organize ourselves uh, is more than just communicating. And, and this one uh, is uh, potentially another greater uh, revolution, which I hope to see it in my lifetime. Okay, so, so first of all, I guess I believe like Bitcoin as a financial system is going to be around. It's still going to be fancy, I guess. Um, but besides that, um, I believe like taking blockchain as a potential way of getting accountable systems, well, like systems that give you guarantees on how they behave, um, that give you transparency on how they work. Um, one thing could be supply chains or food safety. I guess that's a very promising field. Um, probably you can solve some or most problems without a blockchain, um, but there will be problems where you have like distrusting parties where perhaps like blockchain is going to help. Uh, and I believe that's a very interesting space for further endeavors. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yesterday at dinner, we um, later on, we talked a lot about um, data and user data, uh, how they can control their personal data on the internet, and I think this is also um, a huge potential for applying the blockchain to get accountability of how data is shared between different stakeholders and also get transparency to the user so that they know what's happening with their data. Yeah, in fact, <coughs> along those lines, uh, the Center for Disease Control and the Food and Drug Administration have been working with IBM people mm -hmm. on that kind of topic. The other thing that um, the Tapscott father and son team's book talks about is the fact that in its uh, fully mature state, blockchain technology is, will be like the second coming of the internet in terms of how widespread its impact would be on all of society rather than you and I as technical people. I think Martin made a good point with the question which problems can be solved by the blockchain and I think maybe that is interesting because at the moment we have this big hype, there are so many startups and everybody has its own, his own and her own use case for blockchain and I wonder if there's maybe a question that we can ask to find out which problems make sense that we, that we solve them with blockchain technology and for which problems maybe it doesn't fit. Do we have an uh, answer for that? Yeah, in Everyone? fact, in my slide deck, if you look at the full deck rather than the slides I showed, uh, it's in the hidden slides, there's one flow chart that the World Economic Forum, via some university people, developed the set of questions to ask to determine what kind of use cases are appropriate to be done with blockchain technology and which ones are the ones where you should use traditional databases and transaction processing and such. But they have a big mistake there, and I point it out in the slide itself, which is, oh, if you are dealing with physical resources or assets, they say, forget it, you can't use blockchain, and that's completely wrong. What do the others of you think about that? Typic typical problems, maybe, that might be solved with blockchains versus problems that are not suitable for blockchain technology? performance yeah so I mean again this uh, I, this is the opportunity to repeat my talk right it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at least 50% of the people yeah, like. <laughs> um, 
So, so again, I, I, I think you, you have to ask what does blockchain buy you? What is the value proposition? And I think it, uh, it implements a concept of real life, which I would call witness or giving proofs that something happened. And so it is good wherever you need proof um, in the digital world where you need digital proof. And if you don't need it, don't use it. Right? It's um, as simple as that. Also provenance, right? It's not just yeah, anyone. Yeah, thing. well, it's proved with problem, but yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think um, Silvio brought up uh, one of the most important words here in this talk. It's uh, disintermediation. So basically, the most fundamental question, at least for public blockchains or blockchains in general, I guess, is are there mutually distrusting parties that cannot agree on a third-party mediator? So. If you can agree on a mediator and it's not too expensive to use that, then go for it and use it. And if there's any possibility that, that you cannot find such an entity or that, you, that it's really too expensive to, to uh, deploy it, then blockchain might be um, for you. But there are subsequent questions afterwards to, to ask. Um, but this is, to me, the most fundamental one. So performance, response time, throughput. New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ transaction rates just cannot be dealt with even by private blockchains today. So but what you say now, that sounds like blockchain solves only very few problems, right? Because isn't most of the times it's, it's easy for people to find a mediator, isn't it? What? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <That's your laughs> you woke him up. So, well, so first of all, you know, I, I, I really believe um, the world is a big place and we do not know each other. So how can we say that you know, finding a trusted common person? I trust this many people. I don't know how many you trust. But <laughs> the, the, the possibility that there is an intersection is very slim. So whenever we talk about, you know, we can always badmouth you know, uh, blockchain as much as we want, but somehow the world, uh, guess what, wants to have a bit more decentralization, whether we like it or not. And so sometimes when... Uh, um, the throughput may not be as much as you want, but what is the alternative if, you know, to go through a trusted third party and tell them, really, my innermost desire or price to pay is this and this? Yes, tell me. And, I will do. and then we trust that, that person? No, that's not the way the, way, uh, the world works. The way is forced to work this way for lack of technology, and it is our responsibility as technologists to change the way the world interacts. So if you have uh, trust, uh, trust issues, blockchains can actually really help. And the throughput will come, but <laughs> the trust, if it's not there, you know, you are comparing negative infinity with uh, a positive number. It, it cannot possibly win. I'm going to quarrel with this one. I don't <laughs> think ahead. in the most general sense, in a way where you can deal with people who still misbehave and so on, that you can get away from having to know the identity of people and, you know, as a result, be able to nail them if they misbehave. So in that sense, governments and authorities and all that are just not going to disappear. So all the reputation tracking and this and that that you do, even when you rent a car or, you know, rent Uber, let's say, you give a rating. So this notion of establishing somebody's uh, credibility and such Better Business Bureau, all those sorts of things. I don't think they're all going to just disappear just because people adopt this whole notion of completely decentralized and trust-free, blah, blah, blah. In a sense, even in this Bitcoin world, when money gets stolen and so on, if you don't know the identity, who are you going to appeal to? And then you get messed up. And so I don't think the world ever will be in a state where you just don't need the courts and the governments and any kind of licensing and so on. This whole libertarian anti-government kind of thing, I don't think will really, for any time in the future, become a, a fully functional thing without all the entrapments of law and this and that, that we have authorities. So you think we don't need public blockchains at all? I still am struggling with trying to identify really compelling use cases for public blockchain with the same level of assumption that was made with Bitcoin where all you know about somebody is the address and their public key. Otherwise, you have no clue whether it's man, woman, whatever. That, I think, just doesn't make much sense to me 
and I've talked to enough people, argued with enough people across the globe. Ten countries I've given talks in in the last 18 months, and nobody has so far. Didn't find a use case for public blockchains. Maybe Silvio can help us with the idea. <laughs> well, you know, I can help by disagreeing. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so somehow, so what is the case against blockchain? Authorities and things will always be with us. Yes, true. What does this mean? That we should not try new ways of interacting? Listen, even sticking to money, right? We started with barter. Then we, start, we went you know, uh, to gold uh, or precious metals. Then we went to coins. Then we went to checks and fiat currents and things. All the forms of money continue to be with us. Even barter is with us, right? Mm -hmm. If I go to a neighbor who is a lawyer for an advice, then uh, next, you know, she's going to ask me uh, some help with some equation, okay? Or <laughs> whatever. So we, don't, we call it professional courtesy. It's actually barter. So the fact that, you know, all things continue to stay with us is part of our history. So what is wrong about it? So, however, it's our responsibility to enhance the set of tools that we have as humans to interact with each other, right? So that's, I think, it is um, 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 the matter, yeah. Donald, you want to? Yeah, I have to come back to this witnesses because I, I do think it, it covers everything you're saying here. <laughs> if I go with Amazon, I buy something, I trust Amazon, I don't need a witness, right? If I do deals with Mohan, I don't trust him, I need a witness, <laughs> right? So the question about public and permission blockchain is really about do I need a public witness or do I need a permissioned or private witness? And there are applications for public witnesses, right? If you get married, for example, everything that the government, where the government is witness today, it makes sense to do that on a public blockchain because that's kind of the society doing that. It doesn't, it, you can do it in ways that it is, uh, that it actually works. Privacy preserving? And I you can know. actually do that as uh, well. So, but anyway, GDPR and all that, it gets even more complicated. No, no, so. I, the, the, the question is what is witnessed? I mean, that is also the question. Sometimes yeah. you just witness that the transaction happens and you have a hash. Between who and who and identity. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> so I think the, the question of whether public blockchains make sense is actually a question, do we ever need public witnesses? Yeah, and for example, getting married, it, it is a public thing and you don't have much confidentiality there. It's published. If you start a new company, it's published. So you, all these confidential things. And if you have confidentiality issues that you don't solve, you probably don't need a public witness. I think there are many situations where you have the cake and eat it too with some of these sorts of uh, situations where it might be recorded somewhere, but not necessarily exposed unless you have a reason to expose it. Yeah. And there might still be witnesses and they are government authorities or whatever, but that by definition doesn't immediately mean all the information is open kimono kind of thing. So. Yeah. Donald, do you think there are other technical alternatives to blockchain technology that solve at least part of these requirements we are talking about? Um, yeah, so blockchain is like an umbrella technology and again in the talk I said it probably most of the instances of this umbrella just do too much in many ways and too little in other ways and uh, that's why we get so confused uh, about it. But, um, um, but to answer the question, for, um, I don't know, I mean, we, we are inventors, right? Uh, they, we will invent great new technologies and I don't know what we'll do. And whether, but for, for certain things, uh, we can make it work and, and so that's fine. If it's good enough, it's good enough. But uh, we will hit the boundaries and we will get uh, more inventive and push the boundaries and, and develop new ideas and they might be, again, disruptive and, mm -hmm. and game-changing. And things are at their infancy now, the way I said it in the other uh, panel and uh, other session. Aren't fancy? Blockchain technology is now at a stage where relational databases were 40 years ago. Systems had come out, some systems, with all sorts of bells and whistles. But you as the user is, are left to your own devices to figure out under what conditions which features to use and things like that. There's scope for a tremendous amount of innovation with base technology as well as usability aspects of these systems. And so the IBM kind of red books and cookbook style guidance and all that, there's ample scope for lots of things to be done there too. Well, let me just comment on one thing. But you can see that uh, is a new object, 
because even the panelist, supposedly expert of the object, they can't even agree what the object is. So you see that this side of the panel compares blockchains with database. So and the relational databases are way better than blockchains. It's the witness is everything because it's a question of storing information. This other side of the panel <laughs> says, hey, I view it as a way of interacting and removing trust from interaction. So you really see that you have to decide which blockchains we're talking about. In some sense, it is both A and B, but I think that the personal believe that the value is not to try to emulate whatever relational databases we're doing, because the relational database are going to be better at what they're good for. And the question is instead to use for what blockchains are best for, which I think that I hear you saying, that in fact, disintermediation and things like this. So we, we, um, I'm not sure that we are agreeing or disagreeing about the same object. There are two objects here. And uh, Actually, I showed two slides, one listing a whole bunch of distributed systems technologies and another one listing a whole bunch of database technologies. And I said blockchain systems combine many of these things. So by no means are they purely database. Yeah, but the negativism comes always. Uh, look at databases. Look at databases. Because uh, public dealing... witness. What is it to do with public witness? If I want to sign a contract with somebody and I can execute it without a witness, there is an example in which there is no witness. So I'm saying, you know, it's a little bit, you know, um, is a new tool and it's part of our exploration, what we can do for, is actually important. And experimentation is a very important and debates like this, so what is really the killer app, so to speak, uh, of, of this technology is important because it's a new kid in the block and it's going to do some good and some damage and we have to figure out what is good for. Maybe we should start a second round with the question, what is the, the basic or the minimum feature that, of blockchain technology? So is it, is it just, just uh, the proof of digital transactions or is it more? So what's the minimum that it, it, it is a blockchain? I would like to start with, with <laughs> the two of you at this time and go the other way around. Yeah, I think the, the most basic thing is that, that we have an event ledger, it's, uh, especially for the public blockchains, that, is, that everyone has consensus about that this is what happened. So uh, to pick up Sylvia's uh, example again, if we are unknown people among, uh, around all, all around the world, then we uh, have to, to agree on some common state. And this is at least the most basic uh, property to me that, that Bitcoin originally came up with. And we also see the, the, all the um, uh, developments that happened afterwards. So, but this is the proof of digital transactions, right? But <clears throat> yeah, but in a broad sense. Yeah. yeah, but I guess that's the important thing that we are talking about. I mean, we have distrusting people and somehow we want to agree on some truth uh, or, or state or whatever, and that needs to be at least after some point consistent. Um, and that's the essential property that we need. Sylvia, what do you think? What's the basic minimum requirement? I mean, you have to go with consensus because, I mean, what is a society if not a bunch of individuals that decided to agree a certain a certain rules or certain um, side of information and and right now you know we are at a very dangerous spot because there is uh, plenty of uh, big companies who want to tell us how to organize themselves in fact let's do it a bit more efficient and we organize you right and so we we, we know where this led it says give us your data you will never abuse your data <laughs> sure so when it says we are the source of truth let's going to tell you what happened so we have a consensus on whatever happened in the world, just we know fake news, right? So, I mean, enough is enough. So we need a way to counteract all these tendencies. We must, as technologists, develop an alternative which may be used or maybe not, but at least we have a chance not to be, us be us the usual state, which is some silent servant, servant in uh, somebody else's empire, which is organized for us. And I believe that, you know, is either this or nothing. I mean, I'm not in, interested in an in incremental technology for doing the minimal. We should not do for the minimal. We should go ahead and do what we deserve. Donald, you replied to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it's it yes. is about proof <laughs> of a digital transaction. That's it. Consensus is a way to implement it, but the value is proof of a digital transaction. Full stop. I ask later again to that, but give Mohan the chance at first. Yeah, so um, 
it's not at all a surprise that databases are brought up in spite of what Silvio said. The whole point has to do with, in a persistent way, recording certain facts of interactions between multiple entities. And I believe strongly that it's these business processes or workflow systems that involve something that takes place across multiple organizations with individuals within those organizations being part of it. And so by definition, as a result, it's distributed, replicated state information, persistent transactions. Of course, databases are part of the picture. You, you cannot just dismiss away databases as being something orthogonal to any of this. So um, that's it, basically. It involves something where more than one entity organization is involved, and hence there's this need for, in a replicated way, in a trustable way, recording facts so that later on people can't claim that they didn't agree to something and so on. So essentially what he's saying, but expanding it to say it involves multiple organizations and things like that. And with persistence and transaction semantics being part of it. I would like to open the, the um, questions for the audience in about two minutes. Just one more question from me. Um, so please feel free to prepare and to come to that mic. Just line up there, thanks a lot. Um, there's one central thing of blockchain technologies, this, this information is, is stored forever, it's immutable. That brings problems with it. As of course, I think the two of you have, have talked about that in your talk, but again, 50% of the people here didn't hear it, so maybe what, what is the problem? Is there a solution for that? So, um, especially for, for public blockchains where really the assumption is that everybody uh, is able to read um, the blockchain and also we have the problem that there is this public set of nodes that must maintain the blockchain and thus store a full copy of the blockchain. Immutability becomes a problem if I can store arbitrary data that may be objectionable or even illegal onto the blockchain and due to the immutability it cannot be possibly deleted afterwards. So um, this is a way to, to, uh, for a single user, so to say, to, to uh, inject such content into the blockchain and force other users to, to store it indefinitely, uh, at least as long as they want to, to um, faithfully participate in the, uh, in the maintenance process of the overall network. And um, yeah, this is a problem where we argue that most likely you have to prevent content insertion, but it's hard to do it in a firewall way, so that you just scan transactions before they end up in a block and say, yep, this, this is content, I, don't, I ignore it, um, because this is changing all the time, and then you end up in situations like as if you're um, updating your antivirus scanner every day, you cannot do it on a public blockchain system, won't work. Perhaps like going a bit beyond like what we presented in the other session, um, we live in interesting times with like new data protection legislation and stuff like that and like if the GDPR gives you a right to be forgotten or a right to erasure. Um, so, I mean, if data is not needed anymore and you can argue if all data that has ever been committed in a blockchain is actually needed forever or it, at some point you could agree that it's not actually needed anymore. So how do you implement stuff like that? So, so, so how do you give people the right to get like, past, like information on past events out of a blockchain? And in many cases, that's probably something that you would need to implement, uh, but nobody knows how to do that. So are there questions from the audience? No okay. line at the microphone? Can I, can I add to this? Okay, you add some, and in that time you go to the microphone, yeah. Um, this is a myth that's been propagated by way too many people, that blockchains have this bad aspect that once you write something there, it's there forever, and they say, oh, as a result, put something off-chain in traditional database systems. Totally bogus in the following sense. I've spent my, all my life working on recovery and locking and transactions. Even in a traditional database system, when you delete something from the database, it's not like it's gone forever. If you go back far enough in the log, you will find its existence there. So in that sense, the blockchain is no different from a recovery log. So unless you vacuum clean the traditional recovery log, GDPR, whatever, that stuff is still there. So the same thing, as long as you start doing things like vacuum cleaning the blockchain itself, 
it's the same sort of problem. And the idea of forgetting some past stuff in the blockchain is today considered anathema because people, when they initialize a new site, they go back to day zero of the blockchain mm -hmm. and then they run through the whole damn thing. So they insist on having all that around. But if you, for the time being, ignore that aspect, the two are exactly the same. It's not like traditional databases, just because you deleted, have completely forgotten what, it, what used to exist, whether it's social security number, or whatever the personally identifiable information is. But it's, I think it was easier, or is easier to delete things from a database, at least if you know how to do it. No, even in a <laughs> state database of the blockchain, you can do deletes, updates, in place update. I was actually talking about this mm. in the other session. It's just that the fact that the history of what happened in the blockchain data structure as opposed to the state database where the assets that you're managing are kept, that thing, at least today, is supposed to be around forever. Whereas in a traditional recovery log, you could, after you take enough backups and all that, instead of archiving that old version of the log to tape or something, you could just make it all disappear. Yeah, an additional uh, dimension that is opened up uh, via the blockchain is that, at least for Bitcoin and I believe also other cryptocurrencies, people are just putting, because they have their option, they are just putting um, arbitrary data on-chain so they don't even use off-chain storages because just they can in a way. And uh, in this way, so if I have a traditional database, um, there's maybe there are privacy violations that are contained in, yeah, in a, um, they, they have a restricted impact, so to say. So they, they belong to, to a certain um, owner of the database, but with the blockchain, if this stuff is on-chain, it is distributed all over the, um, uh, all over the blockchain network in a, a censorship-resistant manner. So mm -hmm. while um, this is not the trend that uh, faithful applications are following, putting all the stuff directly on the blockchain, this is something that is happening and that uh, this, uh, to me, opens up a new dimension of the whole problem. Yet another reason why I don't like open blockchains. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, but now we have a question. Now, just to make sure, once you're indexed okay. in Sorry. Google, that's it, right? Yeah. I mean, this is, you just put something on the internet, it's indexed by Google, and that's also it. Uh, okay. Your yes. question. In this talk, Mr. Mahan put up a lovely diagram of all the different actors that can be involved in a, especially in a private blockchain situation. Mm -hmm. It immediately struck me that the most dangerous of those actors is the developer. For any of you, how much damage can an evil developer do in this world? Well, at least the way the private blockchain, smart contract development and all that is supposed to happen, I didn't get into that discussion over there. The chaotic state in which that import-export scenario is taking place mm -hmm. today, when you transform it to the blockchain way of doing it, the way you do that is for the different parties to that distributed uh, business process having to sit around a table and design this new set of programs, the smart contracts, which clearly spell out the rules of engagement between these different parties. So it's now a question of what all discipline you follow in doing that. So it's no different from you know, code inspection, design reviews and such things that you do for any kind of software development. But in this case, it's the different organizations which are part of that business process who have to spell out in, the, in a normal, whatever, natural language contract that has to be then formalized and then made into executable code. The rules of engagement between these different parties, what constitutes the level of agreement needed for a particular blockchain transaction to be executed, which is a state change on the asset that's being managed through the blockchain. So there are more. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. There's are more yeah. questions. Um, excuse me, I didn't get the name of the gentleman on the left. Uh, this one? No, on the left, left. Yeah. Mohan. Mohan. Mr. Mohan. Uh, my question to you would be, um, where do you put the functional difference between, because you said you don't like public blockchains. So where do you put the functional and uh, effective difference between um, private blockchain, private authorized uh, blockchain, and a situation where I would like deploy uh, MySQL with uh, 
you know, replication. Um, what is the, the functional benefit oh. of uh, so comparing, the, uh, comparing yeah. the two situations? In fact, I guess you are not at my talk. No, right? yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so this is an unfortunate thing. Because <laughs> <laughs> I talked about this export-import scenario mm -hmm. where the different parties that are involved in something being exported from one company to another company in a different country, namely the guy who picks up the package, takes it to the airport, and then the airline, and the customs authorities, all of these people, they all might be using database systems. Mm -hmm. But the kinds of programs that are manipulating those database systems are all more or less independently developed ones. So there's no single source of truth that's visible to all the participants in such a business process. And as a result, there can be you know, inconsistencies between what's in one database versus another and such things. So the blockchain way of doing it is a more disciplined way of implementing this, which is what I just told Brooks, where the different parties now clearly come to an understanding about what conditions have to be true for a particular blockchain transaction to happen. And then it's the same set of programs that execute in all those nodes and they have this replicated database. So it's still involving database technology and all that, that Silvio thinks maybe is too much, but, uh, but it's done in a more methodical way where there is more accountability. You also involve all this public key, private key, and such way of doing things, which traditionally we haven't done in a relational database and so on. Even in a workflow management system in the past, even when multiple organizations might have been involved, there was a single central database in which the state of the workflow was tracked. They didn't necessarily worry about somebody trying to, after the fact, modify things illegally and things like that. Okay, we so can have a lengthier conversation if you want outside of this <laughs> panel. Okay, I think, yeah, later on. Thank you. Welcome. So, next question. Um, hello, and uh, first of all, thanks for a very insightful discussion. And uh, I have a very simple question, and uh, I would like to ask um, yeah, uh, all of the participants. So my question is if uh, actually Bitcoin has any fundamental value or it's a Ponzi scheme and its price will go to zero eventually. That's what I've been saying, so I'll stop at that. <laughs> um, I'm... I'm a computer scientist, I'm not an economist. Uh, you have to ask that to an economist. I, I couldn't tell, I couldn't answer that question. Anyone of you wants to answer that? Otherwise we have another I mean, um, for me it's a philosophical f question. I mean, like, who guarantees uh, that the euro or the dollar has any value? I mean, uh, as long as you believe that at some later point people will accept this currency or whatever, then it has a value. Um, if you don't, they're not. I mean, we have like countries collapsing and the currency is collapsing. Um, and the same can happen with Bitcoin. But it, there's no inherent value, but there's no inherent value in any not gold-backed currency. Yeah. Okay, I'll repeat what I've said before, but I didn't say it here. Traditional currencies, even after, long after they were no longer backed by gold and such, still have enough relevance and connections to the real world goods and services as regulated by the central bank, reserve bank, whoever, which is much better with economists and all sorts of, you know, checks and balances that are part of governments and so on, in spite of hyperinflation. Argentina and such countries often get quoted to justify why Bitcoin makes sense. I don't buy that because even in those kinds of surround environments, there is still better control with more broad-based people with knowledge doing things than you and I as geeky people thinking we can figure out what the heck the world is all about with these artificially created currencies. Who is Nakamoto to determine what the ultimate number of, maximum number of Bitcoins there could ever be? What's the basis for that? There are such arbitrary things that are part of this picture that has no relevance to real-world goods and services. So that's my complaint, if you like. So if you are into gambling, go ahead and deal with all this Ponzi scheme, whatever oh. that thing is. Oh my God, I thought to be, because my father was a judge, my grandfather was a judge, to be a law-abiding. I don't believe I, you beat me. 
because you abide any law existing future because you think that the future of everything in some government thing you know I must say you know hat off it's very hard uh, to be so much you know um, um, <laughs> law abiding in this sense so uh, listen so fiat currency are also an, uh, another experiment because you have to trust the, the process of the central banks and there are Fiat currency have gone belly up all the time. So we are uh, in, uh, uh, in Middle Europe right now. The Austro-Hungarian um, uh, Empire had bonds that people felt it was you know, better than gold, right? So it no longer exists. So, I mean, uh, this is a fiction. So ultimately, we are all dead men. The only matter is that what do we do during our lives? And if a, a currency like, you know, the one created by Mr. or Mrs. Nakamoto, whatever <laughs> the case can be, has inspired us to generate some different um, 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 activity, and even for so long, I'll tell you, that is worth it, okay? So we have, uh, uh, I believe that, you know, these are, um, we have to be continually experimenting. And by the way, in a way in which, you know, we've, uh, we, have, we are going to be more and more uh, closely manipulated and controlled by state actors. Some degree of relative freedom, even though they can be squashed by government, is somehow welcome, okay? There are plenty of government out there that they want to reduce even cash because cash is too libertarian, right? Because they, if there is no cash, they can take you out of the economy in no time. You don't comply with the rules, you don't oblige everything, you know, you're out. You know, it's like your credit cards are cancelled immediately, you know, you're really out of economy. I mean, I mean with all, you know, I, I'm no particular lover of Bitcoin as an implementation, but I think, you know, hat off to the vision of, uh, of Nakamoto. I think it's a great vision. Who could have said, right, that people were hungry for ICOs, in which they get scammed? That is true. But, you know, right now, people will somehow decide, you know what, I have enough with Goldman Sachs and you know, doing all the IPOs, and then at the discounted price, and then you come to me at a higher price, I want to directly participate. Is this good? Is this bad? No, it's good. And even though it's going to be lasting for maybe a decade or two, I think it's a great experiment, and we should say yes to experiment, and we should actually endeavor to make an experiment better and better and better and more and more trustworthy. I have a question. Do you have a Bitcoin wallet? No. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody here have a Bitcoin wallet? Okay. So I guess that's the best answer. There's some value for some it people. In well, it works. there are any number of suckers in this world, so that's not necessarily proof. <laughs> Give me a break. But that is value. I, mean, I, I come value. from Silicon Valley. 37 years I've lived there. I've seen enough of these charlatans and all that during especially the dot-com boom and bust era where people counted eyeballs and they said, oh, such and such well-known uh, investment banking firm or VC firm is spending so much money on this, there must be something really behind it and all that. A lot of those things in the long run turned out to be all wishful thinking. So having gone through but, these sorts of things... who are you to judge about somebody who has a Bitcoin wallet and says it I'm has just no saying value, right? Or no, no. somebody who does all something else. All I'm saying else. is, I mean, if you go by the past, mm -hmm. there were situations where people use yeah. such logic to say, there is basis. More than and that, you make the argument against yourself. <laughs> because if I look, yes, there has been the internet boom and bust, right? Yeah. But no, listen, so we are actually benefiting from the, I, the greatness of the internet, right? And if you have you say you're going to be scum here, scum here, it seems to be that, you know, we are so lucky to have lived in the 2000s, you know, when the internet came around. We were better off without it. No, we no, no, I, that's not the point. experimentation, <laughs> a lot of companies wasted people's money. Everybody lost the money, particularly me, in, in the other <laughs> But however, a few companies survived and generated great products in which we are all better off, okay? So I think that the notion of innovation should not be lost and we have to keep on being innovative and don't get, you know, scared about, uh, about anything. Just, you know, roll up your sleeve and making these products better because they have some potential, but they need your cooperation. Unfortunately, I have to stop this great discussion at this point because just because of time reasons but lucky thing is that we are all going to have dinner together so later on I think we can follow up with that question I think it's really interesting uh, we have another panel session which starts in three minutes so I think it's no don't go <laughs> one person <laughs> I think it's time for one one last question mm -hmm. and then we have to change to the other panel <laughs>
Hi, thanks a lot for the in insightful discussion. So in the morning, Dr. Silvio said that uh, blockchain should be decentralized. That's the way to go. And in the <laughs> afternoon, Dr. Donald said that he doesn't believe that decentralization should be the root focus. So whom do I trust and where is the receipt? <laughs> or the witness? <laughs> There is, uh, I think you should trust yourself. So I think, you know, everyone can, of us can make, you know, his case and, and, and you must decide. Don't, don't trust anyone of us, right? Uh, um, uh, Mohan um, eloquently makes the case of um, uh, private blockchains and uh, I'm a strong believer uh, in public ones. And for just one reason, because mathematically, if you can implement a public blockchain, you can make it private at no cost, but the other way around is not true. And second of all, when you have you know, um, a private blockchain, you actually think that you know who the players are. So we are bankers, right? We want to have a consortium of banks. Over there, there is another consortium of hospitals. Is there any relationship? No, we are banks, we are hospital. Guess what, you know, there is going to be some way to exchange DNA between uh, the, the banks and the hospital, right, and, and anybody else. And how exactly you do it? So I think that you are better off to have a substratum, which is a public blockchain, in which you are free to create your own private blockchain on top, but at least you have some way to interact with the rest of the world. And if you think that say, oh, whenever I realize that I need to interact with another part of the world, I'll invite him or her in my own private blockchain. Sure, there are you know, easier fantasies to realize than that. So if I want to ship some good from, say, uh, Anju in China, where I was you know, uh, just uh, two days ago, and, and then you want to ship you know, via private track from, to Hong Kong, right, a private track company, then there is a Hong Kong Portal Authority puts in a Panamese flag uh, ship to ship it to Manila, and from there is going to find my way to, Bl to Boston. What am I going to do? Oh, I should invite the track uh, company to be part of my blockchain, because right, uh, for, uh, uh, and then also the uh, Port Authority of Hong Kong, and then this other ship, where is it, to whom it belongs? This is a fantasy. So the point is we are going to isolate ourselves in a bunch of silos, which tribalism has been always profitable, and some politicians now make it even more profitable for themselves to the detriment of others. So sure, there is, a, you know, there is a need for tribes and there is a need for private blockchains. But I think if you want to maximize the value of what you are creating, you have to have the ability to extend your interaction with others, which you have not yet planned or know that you need, have a need to interact. I want to close with one, one thing. And many years ago, when I started, you know, in the 1980s to do public key encryption. You know, people say it's public key encryption. We are a private enterprise. We don't need public key encryption because we know with whom we want to send the messages, right? Public key encryption is only when you send the messages to people you never know. So we don't need it. Sure, you don't need it. So how about your disgruntled employees who leave the company with a secret key? Oops, that is a... So how about the people who actually resign to go to a better job? Oops, I didn't know. You know what? You are. How about the notion that if you are a 50,000 people enterprise, are you really sure that the bad guys are only outside, all 51,000 of yours are, are good? No. So it took a while we won this debate. A few decades later, it's a deja vu. Now we're starting. I want the private blockchains because they're more secure. It's the opposite, okay? You are better off to have a public blockchain and uh, maximize your interoperability in a secure way with the rest of the world. That at least is my opinion, <laughs> more on his ease, and you have to decide for yourself. <laughs> okay. But, that was... <laughs> okay, I... I, would like to I, I hate to say this, yeah. but this question was not about private or public blockchain. It was centralized versus decentralized. Uh, the private blockchain is actually also decentralized and distributed. And so uh, I think <laughs> you were not answering the question. But anyway, <laughs> it was great to listen, <laughs> but I don't think you were answering the question. <laughs> anyway, so to the, to the question, I, I hope I am answering it, uh, is that there are problems that you best solve in a distributed way. And there are problems that are easily solved in a centralized way. And what I was saying is, um, to be a little bit more specific, the problem of ordering transactions is well solved in a centralized way. The problem of creating trust, actually, I think you need distribution for that. Oh. 
<laughs> so I think that was a great conclusion. Thank you so yeah, much. We, we do what we use it for and we look for the best solution for it. Yeah, and as I promised, maybe we can go on at dinner with that discussion. And now, thanks to all of you, we may make a, a quick mix of the, the panel. So, yeah, leave the technical things this on your stairs. Thanks a lot. <laughs>